we have the browsers that I have installed on my machine. So um, these are all the machines, these are all the browsers that I have on my, on my machine. And in case uh, you do have a browser but it is not visible in the dashboard, there is a way to configure it. Okay. So let me um, take a simple test case. I'll launch the Chrome browser here and and press the Alt key and double click on the page to bring up the controller. So this controller you can bring up on any um, any website at all. So for example if I were to google.com pressing Alt and double clicking on this will still bring up the controller. Okay. So let me go back to my start page. I'll bring up the controller and I'm going to record a simple test case. I give a script name and then click on record and then I navigate to my samples website. I give the URL here and then click on go and this is a sample website. Um, I use test and secret to log in into this. So what you'll see is as I perform actions on this page, things get recorded here. Um, the last thing that I did was to click on the submit button, login submit button. So it shows up here. These are all the recorded steps that I just performed. And what we have here on the on this page is um, once we've logged in, this is a list of available books. We add a few number of books and what we want to do is add it to a simple shopping cart. So when I click on add, the cart at the bottom gets populated and it shows different amounts of, of each um, book and the total cost for each and it shows a grand total also. Now, what we'll do is we'll try to assert on the total value. So an assertion is like um, verifying that what we expect is what is actually found on the browser. So this is like checkpoints in um, in uh, other tools like QTP and it is similar to assertions as seen in any of the unit test frameworks. So what we do is uh, I'm right now currently pressing the control key on my laptop and I'm hovering my mouse over different elements. Okay, so right now you see this that it shows up as sell rupees 600 because I hovered over rupees 600 here. I could be hovering on total cost, log out, clear, etc. So you see that Sahi tries to identify this, um, identify the element when I control hover on it and it shows me right now I'm on the total and it shows me the total value and how it identifies it. Now. I can create an assertion out of this by clicking the assert button here. If I click the assert button, Sahi gives me a few suggestions on what assertions I may be able to make. So it talks about assert exists of the total text box, assert that it's visible and assert that the total is 1550. So what we can do here is uh, once we have these um, suggested assertions, we can play around with it by clicking on the test button here. So it shows up as true. Let me actually um, remove a few of these lines and just change this assertion value to something which is wrong. And when I click on test, it tells me that the assertion failed, the expected is 1560, actual is 1550. So this is the kind of assertion uh, that will be performed when we actually run the test case again. So um, this particular evaluate expression box allows us to play around with the system uh, as in when, uh, as when, when we are recording or when we are playing it back also. At any point of time you can actually um, evaluate expressions here. Now let's put it back to what it was originally and we check that it works and at this point we will click on the append to script. Okay. And what is this append to script? It adds this particular step that we just um, have here in evaluate expression into the overall script. Any action that is performed on the base browser is automatically recorded. Anything we perform on the controller 
this is the Psi controller. Anything we perform on the controller, uh, we will need to explicitly add it to the script. So looking at the recorded steps, it see, we see that this assert equal has been added. And once we know that the total is right, we'll log out of this system. So there was a simple script. Um, now I stop the recording. I can go to the playback tab and I'll play this back. Okay. So I set the file to be, I choose the directory in which the script is, the file that is to be executed. And um, I can specify a start URL if I want. So I may actually specify this or I can also leave it blank and um, click on set. So it will take the current URL of this particular page. So why do we need to set the start URL outside? Because initially you may be testing the script against your uh, local machine. Then you may want to test it against your staging server and then your production server. So you can just keep the URL here and change this particular uh, thing here. Okay. Um, I'm clicking on set and then play. Now we see that it's playing back the whole thing. Um, let me do it again um, just to be just to make make it visible to people. Right? So it ran the test case again and once it runs we can look at the logs to see what was the outcome of it. So uh, the Sahi logs look like this. Um, they show all the scripts that you have ever run. Okay, um, these are all stored in the database, and you may look look for the last one would be the one which you just ran. Um, you can also like narrow it down by by using this uh, using the top uh, text boxes. So let's go back to the webinar 47 that we have, um, and uh, we see that you know like uh, the logs show up like this. Each one of these lines is here. The assertions show up in green and if you click on any of these lines, it takes us to the actual uh, line of script. Okay. Um, now let's do one thing. Um, first let's play this back on another browser. So we recorded on Chrome right now. We'll play it back on Firefox. Right, so um, again we see the logs. It shows up here, and it shows that it's this. This was run on Firefox browser. The previous one was run on Chrome. And similarly, we can do the same on I. Now, let me do one thing. Let's look at the script now. So the script itself, we can click on the script link here um, and view it. Or you can go to the record tab and um, this was webinar 47. Oh, sorry. Now, um, what we can do is rather, you know, you can click on the script editor link here. Okay. And we see that this particular script that we had just worked upon um, is open here. What we'll, what we're going to do is to refactor this code such that it resembles your business logic more than um, the code which talks to the browser. So if you look at this particular script, it says set value in the text box, set the value of password, click submit. While this does make sense, this is not how one tester would talk to another or uh, the uh, end user would talk about the business value of this. So rather you would talk about, you know, login as test and secret, add books in these quantities, verify the total and log out. So let us convert this into something which is more closer to the business. So for that we'll actually choose these lines and click on create function here. When we do that, uh, Sahi separates out the variables. So we give it a name called login and click on continue. When we do that, we see that Sahi automatically creates a function called login passes in the variables and invokes that particular function here. Similarly, let's do this. Here we'll say add books, but we we want to give this a little more, these names should be a little more descriptive, so we'll call them um, 
as they exist on the site, which is Java, Ruby, and Python. So these were the names of the books that were being added. So we'll change it accordingly. So we see that uh, the variables have been put in correctly. And this is and of course this is logout. So once we have this, we see that um, Sai has moved all the functions at the top and uh, it has the function invocations at the bottom. Let's save this and we will rerun this script. Now let's look at the logs. We will see that these logs now um, look folded down into the business functionality. So it shows up as login, add books, verify total and logout the same way we had actually um, invoked them. Uh, but if you want to see what is going on inside, you can click on the plus button here and it will show up all the steps. And if you if you click on any of these, it will take you to the actual line of script in the, in the actual script. Okay. So this lets you, um, first like it gives you a very clean way of looking at the logs and if at all you find that there is a problem and you need to dig down deeper into it, all you need to do is like open up and then click on it. Okay. Now let's look at the script itself a little bit. So if you look at the script, this is written in what is called Sahi script. Okay. And Sahi script is just an ex extension of JavaScript. So uh, the syntax is pretty much JavaScript, except that functions need, uh, sorry, um, variable names need to start with a dollar sign. Uh, apart from that, it's pretty much the same, except that Sai has a few more APIs like set value, click, etc. These are the um, these are the APIs that Sai exposes. Sai has these action APIs, and these are accessor APIs, which which let us access different elements on the browser. Now these accessors are written in such a way that they normalize the behavior between different browsers. So um, if you actually identify an element as underscore text box in one browser, it will most probably be the same across all browsers. Okay. Okay. Now we have so far run pretty much this thing from the controller. What we'll do now is to run this from a from the command line. In order to do that, um, what we'll do is I'm going to close all the browsers that are there and go back to the dashboard. And here on the side dashboard, I click on the bin link. Okay. When I click on the bin link, it opens up a command prompt at the desired location, which is user data bin. Um, and here I run this command called test runner. When I run this command, it gives me a few suggestions as to how I can run this. So let's look at the first one. So it shows me testrunner.bat and then the suite that I want to run, the start URL and then the browser I want to run it in. For the time being, let us ignore the suite and let's try to run our particular script from the command line. So our script name was webinar47. We run it against the demo training website and we let's run it on Firefox now. So I just press enter. Um, dot sh. So it launches a browser executes the actions and then closes. Now what if we want to run it on multiple browsers? So let's actually say Firefox plus Chrome plus I. So you'll see that you know that Chrome has launched, Firefox has launched, IE has launched and all three of them are actually like running simultaneously. And you'll see 
that um, Sai reports Chrome success, Firefox success, and IE success. So this is how you would actually execute multiple scripts simultaneously if you wanted to do it from the command line. Um, sorry, this was one script on multiple browsers. So, but this this wouldn't be a normal case. This this would be when you are developing test scripts. But once you have built a few test scripts, you would want to run it all in a suite of test cases. You would want to run like a, a thousand test cases, um, thousand scripts um, by just giving one command on the command line. So let us look what a suite looks like. So I'm going to open a suite which already exists here. Okay, and this has three scripts which are uh, which will run. First is the error screenshot then clicks test and then label.sh this is commented okay now let me run the small dot speed So you see that three browsers have opened up off, off Firefox, or two have shut down, and now the third one is, is currently running something. And, and that also has finished. Okay. Now this shows that it's a failure. So let's look at the logs. And here, when we look at the logs, it shows up in red. You click on it. It shows up a graph of the various things that were run. So on this, this is error screenshot.sh. Let's click on it. And this shows us that uh, the assertion was for 1130, which was a forced error from our site. It's actually 1150. So we actually forced an error here. Okay. And what this also does is like we have actually added a uh, an on script error callback function, which will always be triggered when an error occurs. Okay. And in that we have called a take screenshot function which actually takes a screenshot and embeds it right here into the into the logs so um, let's look at this error screenshot because this is a useful useful script um, so this is just like the one we had recorded okay except that we say that on script failure um, or on script error is equal to this function okay now what happens here is uh, this is a callback function. It will get called whenever there is an error or when the, whenever there is a failure. Okay. And what's an error and what's a failure? An error is when you're looking for a you, if when you're trying to click a button which does not exist. So the application cannot proceed further. A failure is when you're trying to assert a value, um, but the elements themselves are present on the system. So you're just trying to assert a value and that assert is wrong. So it will mark a failure, but that doesn't prevent it from going ahead and doing the rest of the actions. So th that would be a failure. Now let's also look at a few other, um, a bigger suite that has run. So here, like I see that one, some of them have failed, some of them have passed. Let me click on one of these. So this is the kind of graph that it shows and how much time each one of those took to playback. Okay, and if I wanted to click on any of them, I would see what errors were there in that particular thing. Okay, and again, like of course, I can open it up, uh, click on it, and go to the line of code. Now, let's also look at one other thing. Um, Not only can we actually look at just a single script, we can also compare two different scripts. So let's let me check these, uh, compare these two things, and say compare suites. And here it shows me a comparative graph. Uh, the blue one is actually I, and the pink violet one is actually Firefox. Right. So we see these relative graphs. Um, in some cases, you may see a large um, difference. In some, you may not. So, um, so one other thing I can do is like when I see these like this, I can actually 
select these two screenshot.sh files and click on compare screenshots and in this case what it did do is it are actually um, bring up those two particular scripts and show them side by side so you see that you know this was this is for Firefox this is for IE so you see these screenshots coming up side by side so you can also compare these scripts if you wanted to for screenshots now I'm going to actually uh, step back a bit and going to show you something about how Sai script itself works um, so let's go back to the sample website and let's also examine the script itself for a second So if you look at the script, you will see that there are no weights in this overall script. And why is that? Because Sahi automatically waits for page loads and Ajax activity. So if you look at most of the other tools out there, uh, half the code that you need to write is about synchronization. You actually need to say that I will wait for this particular element before I proceed on this. So uh, that's because the tool itself is not capable of waiting for that particular element. Sai automatically waits till the page page frames, iframes, etc. have loaded properly. And even after that, if there is any Ajax activity, it will wait, it will monitor it and wait till Ajax activity has subsided. And only then will it try to actually click on a button. Okay. So let me just do one thing. Here, um, let me change this text box user to text box user 1. And we'll run this again. And we see that when it is when it is at set box set value text box user one, it's not failing instantly. It's actually waiting for some time. Okay. And once it waits, it'll it'll take some time before it fails. So here, um, so what you'll see is this has failed, but it has taken a longer time than it would have taken if it had actually found it. The reason for this is Sai actually waits for page loads, wait for Ajax activity and even after that it when it sees that it cannot find an element it will retry it after about two seconds and that it will do for five times. So normally any step executes in, in, in a, at a gap of 100 milliseconds and if it cannot find that element it will wait for two seconds try retry it wait for two more seconds, retry it, etc. Because of all this um, retries and the ability to actually recover from errors, the number of times Sahi script fails is, is much lesser than uh, most of the tools. While there is some level of, uh, of random failures that do occur because of the browsers and uh, the systems themselves, uh, it, is, it is far lesser and like much more manageable in Sahi than in most of the tools. Now that is one thing. The second, the, the weights is one thing. Uh, you don't need to add weights. Uh, if you need to, there are like APIs to actually wait for a particular amount of time or wait for a condition, but you will hardly need to use it. Now the other thing that Sai actually excels in is object identification. So let's look at that object identification. So in this particular page, there are three different text boxes and let me control hover on each one of them the first one shows text box Q the second one shows up as text box Q1 and the third one shows up as text box Q2 okay now what are these Q, Q1, Q2 so let me just take you to the source of this page which um, you may or may not understand but let me just like talk about it still now we see that there are three different te text boxes input type equal to text name equal to Q input type equal to text name equal to Q and again name equal to Q okay now all these basically have have the same name of Q so how does Sahi identify these so let me control hover 
So the first one is Q because there was no other duplicate that it found for the first one. For the second one, when it went there, it said that hey, I already have seen one Q, so I'll add an index to it so that I can uniquely identify. Okay, and then Q2. Now, while Sahi has tried to add indexes to it, this is not good for automation because if the order of Ruby for Rails and Python cookbook changes tomorrow, this order, the, the text boxes will be incorrectly identified. So what we want to do is remove the dependency on any index while identifying these elements. Okay. Now, how do we do that? If we were to talk as a tester to tester, we wouldn't talk about give me the text box Q, Q1, or the first text box, second text box, or third box. Rather, we would be talking about give me the text box near core Java or give, give me the text box near Ruby for Rails, etc. So there is a concept of of relating one element to another, and that other number, uh, other element is actually significant as far as the business sense is concerned. So for example, in, in this list of books, the title of the book is very important for the business. Okay, um, The text box is something that relates to the title. So similarly, we will do the same thing for um, how we automate our script. Okay, So in order to identify this text box with, re with relation to this Ruby for Rails, what we'll do is we'll press the control key and hover over Ruby for Rails. Okay? So this gets identified as cell Ruby for Rails. Let me click on highlight to show you where it is. So it, that it is there. Okay. Now I press this anchor button here, which is near the click button. I click on the anchor button and then control hover on the text box. Okay. So here it shows me as text box Q. Let me copy and put it here for better readability. It says text box Q near cell Ruby for Rails. Let me highlight this. You see that the second text box has been highlighted. So let me change this Ruby for Rails to something else. So you see that you know now you can relate one element to the other, and this actually gives us a very powerful way of of accessing elements on the browser. Um, a simple case in point would be if you had a a tree-like structure for showing the folders and, and then like you have a tree pane and then a view pane and the view pane has like you know files that are visible. So in the in the tree pane normally you would have a plus icon or a minus icon near the label of the folder. So what you would do is if you click on the plus icon it will expand, if you click on the minus it will collapse. Now this can be very tricky to identify unless we use something like near etc. If you had, if you had to identify that plus icon in Sahih uh, using say we would actually do it as underscore image what are that plus icon images comma near the label of the folder okay so let's look at uh, it will be very similar to what we have written here and apart from near we also have other APIs like left off right off under um, above etc okay now let's also look at one other thing here we say text box queue near Python cookbook. What if we did not know what we did not know the full name of the Python cookbook? Let's say that you know we only know about Python. We can put a put forward slashes before and after it to mark it as a regular expression, and then we can highlight it. So we don't even need to know the full thing. We can actually use partial expressions, and this regular expression can be used in this in Sahi wherever a string can be used. So wherever you are doing a uh, a string match, you can also do a regular expression match. So now we have um, we have looked at how we identify different elements. Okay, um, we have looked at the weight mechanism, which we don't need to actually code for much. Okay, and the other thing that Sahi does very well is automatically looping through frames and iframes. So what I'm going to do now is open up a sample website. Okay. Um, so let me open up iframes test. So what it has, it has two different, these two are two different iframes. Okay. In most other tools, you would need to first get to the iframe, get a handle to the iframe and then look for elements. But if you look at how Sahi does it, look at the link test on control hovering on that. It shows up as link test here. And the second one shows up as link test one. Okay. So even though they are in, they are not on the main page, but actually in two different iframes, Sai just treats the whole thing as one single page and tries to identify different elements.
okay so this can be a very big time saver if you have a website that you need to test which has frames iframes etc so so far we have seen how to write a script how to actually play it back on a single browser multiple browsers how to execute a suite um let's also look at another script here now in this script what we are trying to do is to perform the same login add books verify action but with multiple sets of data okay so here we have specified these multiple sets of data and this overall um actions that we needed to perform we have clubbed them together in one single function and we have we have called that function in this data drive api so what the data drive api does is it takes this data looks at each row and passes this each the values in each row to add and verify so that add and verify is called as many times as there are rows in this particular data okay so it will be called three times with this and this and this set of data okay now in this particular example we have given this as a a hard coded array in the script itself you can also actually save it as just a csv file and use that csv file so for example i could have just moved this off into and put these values and just remove these so that it looks like a csv file so and how do i read the csv file all i need to do is and that is all it is required to actually data drive a particular script so you create the function that you want to be called again and again you create another csv file which has the values of it and then you just call it okay um i've actually put it in the wrong place and uh, just give me one second i'll okay so it already has an example here um with using the csv file and this is the value let us just run this so this is the first set the second set and here we have forced an error so it will fail but it will continue to do the rest of the stuff for the next row also and if you look at the logs it shows us each one of these and we can open this up we know that verify total has failed we look at it it says that you know 1650 so this is how we can actually debug this so we know which set of data it was that we ran it against and we can easily debug that now there is one other use case that happens um which is if you are user um if if your automation the person who actually has the business knowledge is not very savvy in programming um but he has a lot of good business knowledge on figuring out how the overall system works so this especially happens in banking and other organizations where uh, there are business analysts who understand the domain very well but may not be hands on in the automation field so in order to enable them to do automation um 
what we can do is uh, let me actually run it first so I'm going to run a Excel sheet from here okay um, so this is a framework sample.xls file I'm going to click set and then play you see that it does something like what we did right now let's look at the logs if you look at the logs it shows us just a minute So this is what a sample.xls log looks like. Looks like, okay. And here, um, it looks like the actual file in the Excel file in which we we do this particular scripting. So this is what the Excel sheet itself looks like. We have a test case, or the test case name, and then we have these actions. We say log in with test and secret, add books in these quantities. Um, verify total and logout. This is pretty much what we did in the script but what we have done is we have actually moved off these functions into what is called the sample lib.sh. Let me just open up sample lib.sh. So sample lib.sh has all these functions that we had created using the script editor okay and a couple of other and what we are doing is to actually just include that particular script using load say and we are calling the functions that are defined there okay so what this allows the uh, business analyst to do is if he knows which functions are there in the script he can just call these he doesn't know, need to know much programming okay so he can actually put in various test cases in the excel sheet itself this excel sheet also has the ability to have data data driven kind of test cases so he can just like do it in an excel sheet itself and run that Excel sheet directly from the controller and get reports which resemble what he had actually done. Right? Um, now, one other question that uh, is often asked is um, do we leave the identification of elements in the script itself or can we actually have? another place like an object repository where we keep all these uh, elements so what we'll do is Sai has the concept of object repository um, it, for that like we need to uh, let me not do it from here so from the dashboard you can click on configure you go to user data dot properties and here um, on the left hand side you can view the actual site dot properties of which you can override any of the different elements so a, a different properties so what I'm going to do is copy over the script dot object repository dot enable and copy it into user data dot properties and I'll set it to true save this so whenever we make a modification to user data dot properties we need to restart sai we'll do that So let me record the script again. Webinar 47 object repository. So click on sample application, test and secret login. Okay, and log out. Let me stop this and open this up in the script editor. So what we see here is that it says include object repository.sh and then it navigates to this and here we see that in a set value text box user takes this password and then login logout etc. So here you see that these have become constants and what are these constants like? Let's look at um, we'll open up object repository. 
we see that you know text box user text box this password submit login etc so this was already there so let me actually just clear this and do it once more uh, you'll see that it pretty much does the same thing uh, let me also say this here. So you see that um, this particular thing has been, all these elements are recorded as constants and uh, if you load this, it shows up all the, each one of these elements which will just text box, user, password, submit, login, etc. We have just assigned it to variables and use those variables in the other script. And that's that's how simple it is to actually maintain an object repository inside. Okay? Um, in the coming version, we allow you to actually choose the object repository along with when you are recording it so that you don't need to have just one single object repository like it is right now. So what we normally uh, encourage people to do is to um, record it once um, and then move off um, these um, constants module wise. So if you have a user module, move off the user related stuff into that uh, user constants dot sh, um, admin constants dot etc. Okay. Um, so, uh, for, so far, like we have been showing much of it as record and playback, but it need not be just record and playback. You can actually script it. Um, uh, that is what we encourage. Record and playback actually takes you to through to like, let's say 30%. Um, but after that, we do need to actually organize the code well. Um, though Sahi actually eases out the overall part of um, automatically reporting, waiting, identifying elements easily, etc. We still need to modularize those into functions, um, use them in and other files and then inc create a library kind of file for different uh, modules and then include the correct files in your script and then call the functions. So that is how you would reuse these functions. You'll create these scripts, put them into uh, into another file. So uh, as an example, let me show you. Um, so this is a script which is just saying include this and then it calls these functions directly and then uh, if you look at this particular file, it has the function definitions. So this is how you would actually use it. You'll wherever you want to use login again, you will just include that that particular uh, library file and then call login there. So that le lets you minimize code duplication and helps you maintain the scripts better. Um, so so far, what like much of what we do is actually using Sai script. Sai also has a Java driver wherein you can actually code using Java itself. Uh, you, you can also record in the Java dialect. Um, though it cannot be played back from the controller itself, you need to copy it into a Java file and then play back the Java file. Uh, similarly, you can do the same thing with Ruby. Um, if you are interested in those parts, search for a file called driver client test which comes with, your, um, with the Sai installation. It will be in the sample Java project file and you can see how uh, Sai and calls the how how you can use the Java version of Sai. Okay. Um, similarly, for Ruby, you have a similar um, thing for Ruby. Now, Sai Pro actually has a lot of a lot of other functionalities. Uh, it can automate flex applications. It can automate applets. Um, it also can do distributed playback, uh, which means that if you have a thousand scripts and you want to minimize the amount of time that it takes to play them back, uh, you can ask Sai to distribute those test cases across multiple machines. Um, so in order to do that, what you would do is uh, there is a, just like we ran test runner, uh, we can run this file called drun.bat and drun is, is short for dis distributed run and this one um, uh, here if you specify the nodes on which you want to run this, run the scripts against, so you could actually say localhost 999 and then one machine, other machine, etc. So when you add the add either the machine names or the IP or the um, domain names of them, Sai will when when you run drun.bat, it will ask Sai to distribute those test cases across all those machines. So Sai will automatically figure out like which machines have the capability to run that particular script, and it will figure out whether um, there are scripts running there. If not, it will send some scripts to be run there. It will collect all the reports and uh, get it all together on on a single machine. Um, so and that, those reports too would be saved in the logs uh, like this, and these logs are actually saved in a database. 
um, it's a it's an inbuilt database uh, that comes with Sai called H2 database. Sai can also be configured to actually log into a MySQL or an MS SQL uh, database. Um, that's pretty much what we wanted to cover in this particular webinar. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can either ask us now, but we don't have much time right now. So you can either ask us now or you can email us at support at sahi.co.in. Um, so this is our... Um, our email address to contact for any support on Sahi Pro. Um, if you are using open source, uh, you may actually uh, uh, reach out on the um, public forums. Uh, we have a we have a fairly active forum in sai.co.in slash forums. So you can go here and uh, post your questions here. The if you want more information about Sai, you can actually go to the Sai.co.in website and uh, you can download Sai Pro from here. If you want to read about the documentation on how to actually, um, if you want to see a demo or you want to actually learn about the Sai scripting language or see how to do data driven testing, um, parallel playback, how to run on SSL sites, uh, how to trigger your test cases from Jenkins, how to trigger them from Ant, uh, how to read. Um, Excel files, etc. You can get most of the documentation on the on the Sahi website. Okay. Um, if you if you are still unable to actually get started, you can of course like email us at support at sahi.co.in and we'll be very happy to help you out with that. So uh, right now we can take a few questions. Uh, I think there are a couple of questions coming in. Okay, is any programming language required to work in this tool? Um, so th the thing is, you will need some uh, basic knowledge of a programming language. You will need to know about uh, um, at least how variables, functions, loops, etc. work. But uh, we don't actually um, say that you need extensive knowledge of programming languages. You need basic analytical skills and some way of uh, using the scripting language. Um, but Sai does much of the heavy lifting for you. Uh, there is a question called, can we automate Google search? Yes, it, sh it should be possible to automate Google search. Um, if you know how to, uh, what you're looking for and wh what to assert on, you should be able to do that. Uh, can we integrate this with any other bug tracking tool? So uh, this this question is a, is a mixed question in the sense that we don't actually say that uh, you when, when a size script fails, you directly log a bug into it. You may want to, but uh, in most cases, what we normally do in our builds is, uh, when we run a suite, a suite has the capability to say that uh, whatever failed scripts you have, you store them separately and then rerun them once the suite, is, uh, suite has finished. So we have this concept of a failed suite that you can actually trigger when a suite fails. And even after that, we actually like um, encourage people to look at the overall uh, what happened and then only log a bug because like at times the bug may be the the functional test failing maybe because of a network error or some um, some some failure in the in the um, on the client side maybe. So uh, you if you want to still log a bug directly whenever a script fails, Sai has the ability to trigger any URL calls from the script. So you can actually use this API called read URL and pass in whatever HTTP URL that you want. Uh, so the normally bug tracking systems have a way of submitting information for a bug. It may either be just a REST call or it may be a form submit. You can do either of these from a Sai script itself using the API called read URL. Okay. Uh, can we define the browser name in the script too? Uh, that we wouldn't recommend. Like we actually, uh, in fact, it's not possible right now to actually specify the um, browser name in the script itself. Um, if you want it, if you don't want to like specify it every time, create another batch file in which you have all these parameters already written down and call that batch file. Uh,
Uh, there are a couple of questions which uh, I believe like we may need some more information. So there is a question called how can uh, how can Sai help me in retail projects? Um, if you can actually like uh, elaborate on that question, we may be able to answer that. Or else like if you could drop a, drop us an email. We can uh, we can take this offline also. Uh, how about handling dynamically changing objects? Actually, Sai is really good at uh, identifying most of these things. See, one of the things that happens on any web interface is that. Uh, you do not randomly give information to the end user. You always like have some label or something to to educate the user as to what that particular thing is that you that you want uh, identified. So, um, for example, what happens is let's say that you have a you have an admin screen which has a list of users that you want to approve. Okay. Now these list of users can be dynamic. You, they keep adding. Now, when you are running when you are writing a test case, normally what happens is in as part of the automated test you set up the data before you actually verify on or perform an action on that particular data for example in this particular case you would actually submit the form to create a user of a with a unique name okay and the unique name can be a timestamp plus a, maybe like abc plus timestamp or something like that okay and when you are trying to and store this id somewhere and when you are trying to look look for like you know the an approve button near this you will actually go to the admin screen and say give me the approve button near the stored id that i already have okay it will give you the correct approve button and then you can click on it and go ahead so it is just about like using the near under apis etc in a in a smart way along with uh, setting up the data correctly okay in a unique enough way so that you can identify and work on it. Okay, so um, just give me a second. I'm scrolling through a few questions. Does the user-defined scripts can be written based on the identification of, of objects present in the source code? Yes, very much. Because like all the attributes that are being used by Sahi are actually available in the DOM and available in the source code, most of them. Okay, so you should be able to actually um, read it right away from there. But reading from the source code can actually be a painful thing. And for multiple reasons, one is like only if the page is simple, will you actually have the source code uh, uh, referring to those elements. In in if if you have a slightly complex web application, you would have most of it generated via JavaScript. In which case, you wouldn't be able to see it in the source at all. So um, you may or may not be able to do that, but uh, Sai allows you to do it very well. Okay. You can run connect to a database and uh, run a stored procedure. Um, we'll have to check, but see one of the things with Sai script is that. It allows you to call any Java API by because Sahi runs inside a Java VM. It can call any Java function, which means that if you actually add um, the JDBC jars to the class path of Sahi, you will be able to pretty much invoke anything that the Java JDBC library allows you to do. Okay, so you may be able to run a stored procedure. You may be able to get a result set and actually iterate over it. Yeah, uh, can we pass parameters optional in function? In JavaScript, almost every parameter is optional. If you you can check inside the function whether the parameter is null or not. If you don't pass it, it doesn't matter to say to the JavaScript function. So Sai waits two seconds for page load. For example, if there are multiple queries in the page, it will take some time to load the grid page. Then Sai still. So okay, so Sai does not wait for two seconds for page load. It actually waits for 150 seconds total, which is two and a half minutes. Okay, so uh, but what I was actually mentioning about two seconds is if there is a failure, so uh, the, the, this is how it will proceed. Sai before it executes any step, it will check whether the page is fully loaded. Okay, and for this, it will it can wait up to 150 seconds. After that, it will check whether any AJAX activity is there. For that also, it can like overall the total wait time will be 150 seconds. Okay, now. After those two things have elapsed, if it sees that there is a button it has to click and that button is not available on the browser, it will still wait for two more seconds and then like retry it and retry it five times. Okay. The reason it does this is, uh, apart from AJAX and page loads, there are also other things like set timeouts that can be uh, working inside a web application. So if 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 the button was to appear after like three seconds, let's say because of a set timeout. Uh, Sahi may have failed, but because of this retry, it will actually correctly get to that point and do it.
can we have public and private function if you're using java yes if in sai script uh, you don't uh, in javascript you don't have the concept of private or public normally in javascript what people do is uh, they they have a coding convention uh, that like you actually say uh, public functions leave it without anything the the private functions you may want to actually double underscore it or single underscore it at the start can we trigger the run at least from test case rules see any run can be sai actually gives you a way to trigger a test case just from a url so one of the things that so you can do is uh, there is if on the dashboard like you actually see this um, on the dashboard there is a web link here okay if you click on the web link uh, you will get something like this okay so this you can access any other machine also let's say that your sai is running on another server you can say you know sai server colon 999 and you will get something like this and here you can say firefox i want to run it on firefox with start url um site.code and slash demo and uh, we want to run that webinar 47 okay now let's say that we want to run this i can click on this run button here which is the triangle button here and if i click this it will actually trigger the test case so now what you can do is in your in your whichever your uh, test automation tool uh, sorry and uh, test case management tool is if you can just embed these urls in it which will trigger the test cases it can automatically trigger it so and you can have a separate sai server where all these scripts will run so you can trigger it from your test management tool it will execute the scripts and then you can get the logs uh, right here by looking at the logs etc okay uh, we also have integration to actually launch these scripts and get the reports back from let's say uh, c sharp if you are using um, MTM, the Microsoft Test Manager. Um, you can call it from Java itself if you're using any of the other Java based tools. So it is possible to actually trigger a test case on one browser on multiple browsers, or you can trigger a test suite on on browsers, uh, right? Uh, just by actually calling uh, the URL uh, which points to Sahi. See how is it different from Selenium? See Selenium actually. Um, has has a very different take on how we approach this problem uh, with selenium you need they they say that you know you you need to be uh, looking at it as if you are a developer you actually need to build frameworks around it you need to um, you identify elements using xpath xpaths are actually very brittle or you use css selectors which are also brittle so the object identification mechanism is much smarter and simpler and more stable in sai than in selenium um, uh, with you need to add a lot of weights for um, if you want to use selenium because like uh, if web driver on, if if you're using the older selenium it doesn't have any weights unless you explicitly add weights in the web driver version you have weights for just the basic page load if if it has iframes or if it has like ajax activity in it it will not automatically wait you'll need to add weights in it so it, it already like increases the amount of code that you'll have to write um, then it does not have a recorder so he has an excellent recorder which actually minimizes like 60 percent of the time that you will spend on it um, if you were to like add logging into it, you'll have to build your own frameworks for logging, which is inbuilt in Sai. Distributed playback, you'll need to try to set up a grid, etc., and run it. And even then, you cannot run uh, uh, multiple Internet Explorer instances in parallel. Uh, Sai is one of the only tools. In fact, Sai is the only tool in the world which can actually run IE instances in parallel on a single machine. Um, so the the amount of time it takes to playback uh, tests on Sai is also much much lesser. Um, and overall, if you look at like if like if you already have a, a overall suite, suite working with Selenium, uh, what is your motivation to move to Sai? We actually say that you know if you already have it have it ready, it's all working fine for you. Uh, we wouldn't really say that you know you should move to Sai. But if you actually feel the pain point of um, maintaining the framework to uh, of like. Uh, trying to identify elements and the elements change every time like you have a new build and you have to actually fix those things or like you need to actually um, whenever something fails you need to actually figure out whether the xpath is working correctly or not and if you feel that you know the team itself is unable to actually cope with the complexity of selenium and is spending more time on developing the test cases than actually testing your application in those cases you may want to actually see for a look for a simpler tool which actually does the automation in a simple way without getting into the way of testing uh, Selenium is a very like programming intensive tool. You may actually like spend a lot of time trying to figure out, make it work, etc., etc., on things that actually like work seamlessly inside. So um, you may actually end up saving more than like 80% of the time you would have spent using Selenium. And uh, especially with WebDriver, what has happened is like WebDriver has like uh, 
library is separately built for each new browser and whenever a new version of the browser comes you'll need to upgrade your uh, web driver uh, version so sahi actually is built in such a way that as long as the browser supports um, a, a, a proxy and it can actually execute javascript sahi can actually work very well on any of the browsers that it means that you know like even if a new browser comes up tomorrow um in 99% of the cases sai will just work as is on the new browser you don't have to make any change to sai itself so sai is kind of like you know uh, you know that things works in a stable way you don't need to keep upgrading along with like uh, whatever new thing comes so that minimizes the amount minimizes the amount of uh, maintenance and the um, chance of uh, bugs creeping in okay um one other thing is uh, we actually because of the way sai is structured it is very easy to run it on an run the sai scripts on browsers on the android device or an iphone uh, which like you may need to actually install software for that for web driver or uh, for sai you don't need to install any software you just change the proxy settings and then you'll be able to execute any test case on your mobile device so another question that's been asked is like uh, can we test web services or soap calls um as as i mentioned before uh, sai has the ability to trigger any java code from the sai script we ourselves do not have a solution for um, uh, making soap calls but you can use any of the inbuilt java libraries or third party um, java libraries which actually can make soap calls and you can easily call it from inside sai so it's it's a it's a matter of just adding those jars to the class path and invoking those methods from the sai script um and there's a question that if there are no element ids present in the page uh, then how will sai identify it see uh, sai actually identifies each element by multiple attributes it doesn't just identify it by one attribute so uh, for example um if i were to look at this text box so here you see that um there are alternatives given here so which actually say that you know this can be identified by user or by the index of it if you have any class name or any css attribute or anything at all that can identify that element you can use any of those properties in sai to identify it and if at all there are like absolutely no properties associated um, uh, which are useful then you can use something else in the user interface like a label or or some other like identifying text or a tooltip text to actually identify that element so um, it is fairly uh, because of the amount of flexibility it has in identifying it by various different attributes you can even mix and match and like use different attributes to actually identify an element uh, or you can use plain javascript to use it or you can use jquery to use it you can use any library that is already available on the browser to access an element so um it's it's very flexible you can actually uh, you would be you sh you will be able to identify almost every element out there and if at all like uh, this is this this is never true but like if at all you feel that you know there is nothing Uh, that will work here except xpath sai also supports xpath and you can use xpaths and css selectors but this is never true that you know an element is identifiable only by xpaths and not and by no other property okay um somebody's asked uh, can you briefly explain what are the advantages of sai script over javascript there is no real advantage it's just that you know like there are apis that are needed to control the browser which are added as apis in sai so um, sai uses sai script because it has to actually do these things of you know automatically logging automatically waiting um, um adding these extra functionality to javascript to actually click uh, um, identify elements etc to do all this what we do is we actually expose it as a sai script which is like javascript and then we do a, a, a layer of parsing and that parsing actually adds a lot of these like debug data etc and then that parsed file is actually executed so that is the only thing that we do here um the syntax itself is all javascript so you should be able to do like pretty much whatever you want to do with javascript here Uh, how can sai handle exceptions uh, like any other um, programming language you can have try catch etc but um, in most cases you don't anticipate an error so you don't put a try catch at every place so in that case what you do is you actually have these callback functions of on script failure and on script error and those callback functions like if you just define a function called on script failure whenever there is a failure that function will be called so from there you can if you return true it will actually 
uh, proceed to the next step. If you return false, it'll it'll break there and and uh, um, and stop the script. See, most of the questions that are being asked are actually um, available. Uh, the answers to them are available in the documentation that I just mentioned. So if you go to the sai.co.in um, and go to this particular documentation site you'll see like most most of the, the questions actually answered here okay so even if you're if I'm unable to answer these questions you should be able to find these <coughs> yeah can I open the dashboard automatically and run scripts and close I automatically through script uh, not through script but you can do it through an, an ant ant file ant script or through a batch fit so it's possible to actually start say um, execute the script and stop say so uh, especially if you're running it with um, with Jenkins or any of the continuous integration systems, you may want to do this. So it allows you to do that. So can we use Sai or for any kind of application developed in Django or PHP or JS? See, uh, Sai is uh, is it does not matter to Sai what the backend technology is. As far as it loads on a browser and executes as HTML and JavaScript on the browser, Sai will be able to automate it. So it does not matter what the backend technology is. Um, so we do provide training and we have over 150 customers um, overall right now. Uh, and fairly big names like um, if, if you want to know the customer list like there is one available on the website or you could reach out to us and we may we may be able to like tell you the clients who may not want us to disclose it publicly are all the APIs present on the size side like I think 99% of them are there um, that's it. I think like I've, uh, we have exhausted the questions. Thank you very much for actually um, staying on f till more than 10 o'clock and actually uh, participating in this question answer session also. Thanks a lot everyone. If you need any cl clarifications or if you would like us to actually you know have a further discussion by coming to your organization and doing a demo or like talking to your entire team, please let us know. We can either set up another go to meeting session for your team or we can even like come and talk to your tech uh, technology people in your organization and uh, clarify any doubts you may have. Thanks a lot. I'm closing the session for now. Uh, have a great night.